All right, well, we worship the uh, one true God. One true God. The Bible says this in Isaiah 44, verse 6. It says, Thus said the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there is no God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 30, 43, verse 11, says, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 43, 10, Ye are my witnesses, said the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. We serve the one and true God. The Bible tells us in John 10, 30, it says, I and my Father are one. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our one and only true God. He is the one that we need to keep our focus on. He is the one that we give thanks to for all, all that he has done. He is the one true God. And in this day, as we go each and every day, we have battles. We are at war, people. We are at war. Not so that it's foreign wars, not so it is across the waters, but we are at war within us. We are war within us. Let's be reminded. And so the title for this day's message is that the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, as we ask, Lord God, that you open up our hearts, open up our ears and mind and soul, Lord God, that we may hear your voice, Lord. Lord, hide me behind their cross, Lord. Let your word come forth, Lord God. Teach us all, Lord God, that, Lord, that you are the one true and living God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Very familiar to all of us. We've learned it perhaps even in the Sunday school classes in our youth days. We've learned in chapter 17 about David and Goliath. Very popular in the Sunday school teachings of the young children. So we find here, it, and, and David and Goliath. And 1 Samuel chapter 17. Okay, here we find, in the very few first few verses, we find here there are two armies that are at war, and they're gathered at uh, Shakur, the Philistines at one mountain, and the Israel on another mountain, and in between there was a valley. But really the battle here is against the Philistines and the people of God. But also even in a deeper meaning, the battle is the powers of darkness versus the people of God. In the book of Psalms it tells us this in chapter 2, why do the heathens rage, and the people uh, imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The Bible tells us in John, in John chapter 3, verse 19, it, it tells us that how men love darkness rather than light. Men love darkness rather than light, for the, in their deeds are evil. That's John chapter 3, 19. The Bible also tells us that in Ephesians chapter 6, it says this in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in the high places. So here... We find in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, we find that there's a battle going on. And this battle, of course, really deeply, it's a battle of darkness. 
battle of darkness against the people of God. So we're going to take a look here as we break this down a bit. We're going to take a look at first, actually I have three points, but we'll get to them all. So, besides, uh, how many of you remember Ezra? You remember Ezra, okay? And when Ezra opened up the books, you know, and the people stayed there, what, how, how long did they stay? All day. The people stayed there all day. When Ezra opened up the book, the people were there all day long. We're not going to be here all day long, but we are going to open up the books. We are opening up the books. <laughs> we are going to open up the books, amen. So we're going to take a look at this, and we're going to look at the world's challenger. We're going to call Goliath the world's challenger. He's their champion. He's the guy that comes in between, you know, uh, uh, us, you know, and, and, and himself or in the darkness of the world. He's the world challenger. By the way, let's go to verse 7. Verse 4, I'm sorry. And he says there, And there went out a champion out of the camp of Philistine named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits in a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he had an armed with coat of mail, and, he, and the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his lead, and target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's uh, head weighed 600 shackles of iron, and one bearing shield went set before him. So now we look at this massive man. He was nearly 10 feet tall, maybe in accurate measurements, perhaps 9 foot 9. That would, would make him very tall indeed. Uh, he would look very tall indeed to me. I would have to... <laughs> I know everyone's saying, yeah, everyone looks very tall to you. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, this man was a giant of a man. Okay? He, he represents the world and the world's challenger. He's their champion. And so we find that, that this challenger, he brought men's wisdom along with him. He brought men's wisdom into the fight against the battle against God. God and his people. So he brought human wisdom. He brought that human strength with him. As we know that he says that, and, and that his, his weights that he was carrying, you know, the brass helmet and all the stuff that he was wearing, extremely heavy, 125 pounds, or maybe a 25 pound spear. And, and he had to be very strong. So, and a very big man, a very strong man. So he, he brought this human strength along with him. He also brought this intimidation of his size. Just the sheer size of the man, just to look at this man standing at the mountain, you know, and, you know, as he looks and he intimidated people, he also was persistent in his words of intimidation. He was persistent in his words of intimidation. We read there in verse 8, we pick it up and it says verse 8, and he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out and to set your battle in the area? Am I not a Philistine and you servant to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. Verse 9, If he able to fight with me and kill me, then will, uh, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. So we find here, and even in verse 10, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. He did this morning and night, morning and evening. He would come down and he would intimidate the people of Israel. He would intimidate them. This was a massive man. He was a strong man. He also had the wisdom of man. How many of you know that even in our circumstances today, circumstances and situations today, that we ourselves can be overwhelmed with intensity 
of circumstances in our life. There are problems that, a lot, that arise in our life. There's problems in our lives in our life that can assume the power, can assume power over us and bring stress and anxiety. But we also, rec- we also should recognize this, that what's going on in America today, a voice that is saying to Christians, we want things our way. We don't need your God. We are stronger than you. We are going to overpower you, and you will serve us. We will tell you what is good and what is not good. We will not obey your God, what he has said that is good and is not good. This is what's going on in America today. This is the challenger of the world. Here we find Goliath, this world challenger. He represents the world today. He is, he is that giant of a problem. He is that problem. He's that problem in America today. It's a Goliath that we face in America. Down in verse 11, it says, When Saul and all the Israel heard those words of Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So we come to our first point. The first point is God is greater than our fears. God is greater than our fears. Joshua tells us this in 1.9. He says this, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be not dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, wherever thou goest. Isaiah 41.10 repeats, And says, Fear thy not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Fear not. How many times the Bible tells us to fear not? Fear not. Fear not. The Bible also tells us here in Psalms 118, verse 6, it says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. I, what can man do unto me? Fear not. There's a giant that's going on in America today. But fear not. God is with you. He is with us. He's right there. Remember the fourth man? Remember the fourth man in the fiery furnace? Remember the fourth man in the fiery furnace? Remember how the Hebrew children was tossed in, this fire that was seven times hotter, and who was there in the fourth man? He was right there. He, was, he says, go through that. Go through that fire. But I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. You remember how Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. And what did God do? He shut the mouths of the lions. God is able. He is more than able. He is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings. He is the sovereign God. There is no one else like him. He is the true living God. God will be with you. He will be with us. And so we go on and we look at the leadership of Israel. We look at the leadership of Israel, King Saul. We look at Saul. Here we find that the spirit of God had left Saul. And so did his courage. When the spirit of God was with Saul, he was a triumphal man. He was a man that could fight. He was a man that knew what he was doing in the battles, but he was disobedient to God. And God's spirit had left him. And so now he became a man with no courage. He became a man that was only on the wisdom of man. He became that carnal man. He was a leader that had no courage. 
He was a leader in verse 25. Verse 25, let's go there. Verse 25, it says, And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him and the king will en en enrich him and the great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free of Israel. Here we find this man, here we find the king now, who the, who the spirit of God that has left him, who now, who has no courage, who now was operating on his own wisdom, here he offered to anyone to come up against this giant. He offered them wealth. He offered them status. He offered them power. Doesn't that sound like the world? This is what, the, what goes on in the world. This is what mankind, before he turns to Christ, this is what's in man's heart, in the wickedness of man's heart. In our hearts, we want wealth. We want status. We want power. And here's what, here's what this man, of, uh, 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 Saul, had offered to his people. He offered the same thing that the world offers. Because he had lost the courage and he no longer had the spirit of God in him. And he went on the wisdom of a man. And so that's all he could offer. That's all he could come up with. Isn't it true that we find in our pulpits in America today that we are preaching health, wealth, status, and power in, the, in many of our churches and we call them men of God? They are preaching with simply no effort against the darkness. No effort because they're offering the things of the world. They're offering the things that Satan had offered when Jesus was in the wilderness. So this was the leadership now. This is what the leader was like. This is a problem in America, by the way. We have this in our pulpits. No one wants to preach the word of God. No peoples want to hear sound doctrine anymore. And in fact, they want to hear tickling of the ears now. No one wants to preach that you ought to be holy because God is holy. No one wants to hear that anymore. They want to hear the song, I want to do it my way. And so we look at uh, now the God's servant. We look at God's servant, that's David. We look at David. And we see here in verse 26, and David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, what shall, we, what shall be done to the man that killeth Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And in verse 32, quickly down there, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. So the question is, first question would be, will you go and fight? Will you go and fight? Will you say, here I am, send me. Send me. Would you go and fight? Will you be that humble servant, the humble servant who will have denied self, who is God-focused? Are you willing to hold fast to the word of God? Are you willing to live for him? Are you willing to share in the sufferings of the, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Are you willing and say, send me? David, a young man, said, send me. I'll go and fight. I'll go and fight. So here's our challenge. What's hindering us? For not serving. 
what's hindering us from not serving God? Is it because you don't have time? Is it because you don't have time? You know, you maybe you're waiting for the perfect time. Maybe you're waiting for the perfect time to serve God. Maybe you're saying that I don't have anything to offer, but yet and still God says, I have given you all spiritual blessings. Maybe you say that you fear because I'm not really ready. I'm not equipped to do it. Maybe because your biblical, world, your biblical point of view might cost you something. Maybe because it might cost you your job. Maybe because it might cost you something in your community, in your status. Maybe because you basically are really riding on the high horse of pride. Maybe because the fact that you feel that, that it's really unimportant. Maybe it's not important to you. Then I say to you, you need to examine yourself. Examine your heart. Search me, O oh God. Search me. Or well, maybe because the fact that you're not in God's word anymore. Maybe because the fact that you have been drifting. Maybe the fact that you are and now in a prayerlessness life. Maybe you need to get back to God first. Maybe you need to get there first. We find there here in verse uh, 29. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? So we find here, what's the reason? What's the reason to be in the battle? What is the reason to be in the battle? Well, the answer is in verse 45 and 46. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou have defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts, and to the earth. That here it is, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Here's the cause. Here's the reason why we'll be in the battle. So that we would let everybody know that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lord. We will let all the earth know that what he has done for us, that he hung on the cross, that he was the only one who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, that no man comes to the Father but by me. We are to let the world know the reason, the cause, the cause. Let them know about our mighty God. Let them know about what he has done for us. Let them know that what he is about to do through us and that he lives. He lives. Almighty God, he lives. We are to let them know. That's the cause. That's the cause. He hung on the cross at Calvary, and he rose again on the third day. And there he's seated on the right hand of the Father. He's interceding in your behalf in mine, and he is there, and he reigns forever, forevermore. And one day, he's going to call us home. Here is the cause. Here is the cause. The cause to let the world know that there is a God, that there is a God. Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. 
Bible tells us that God and God alone is to be glorified. He is to be glorified. Isaiah 42, 8, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to any graven image. Glorify him. He is the one to be glorified. We are to lift him up. We are to lift the name and above all other names. Jesus Christ is greater than all names. Lift him up. Glorify him. Give honor and praise to him. Give thanks to him. Not just on once a year on the Thanksgiving. Every day we need to thank God. Every day we need to praise the Lord. We need to teach our children these things. We need to tell them, tell our children, tell our grandchildren, tell the next generation after generation that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Lord of Lords. Glorify him. Raise his name up. Point number two. God will provide. God will provide. We look there in verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistines. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Here we find David remembering the past days. David remembered the fact God has delivered him in past days. Young David had got remembered that God has delivered him out of the lion. Out of a lion, young David. I ain't talking about a man that is a big man like, like Goliath. Here we're talking about this young man, a young man. I ain't even at the paw of a bear. Even at the paw of the bear, he remembered them. He remembered the past. God will provide. Saul had tried to provide David with this worldly armor. He tried to provide, provide this worldly armor. In other words, this physical armor that he was giving to David, which was too big, but also with spiritual human wisdom. Saul was trying to give him the tactics of fighting human under human wisdom. He was also giving him this physical armor. He tried to provide that. But God. I like that. But God. <laughs> but God says this in Proverbs. It says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct our paths. We are to put on and trusting God and his armor. God and his armor. God provided armor. God provided the provision. We find in verse 40, and he took his staff in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in the script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Here we find that God has provided the stones. It wasn't any old stones. I don't know. Some of you men may have had a slingshot. I did. When I was a kid, I had a slingshot. And you wanted the round stones. You, you couldn't put them any old jagged stones up in that slingshot. You wanted something that was really going to propel nicely, you know, a, a round stone. And here, God had provided a smooth round stone, smooth stone for David. But David participated with God. You see, in the battle, we can't just sit back and say, well, God's going to fight my battles. No, we have to participate what God is doing. And what did David do? David didn't just look and see that the stones were on the ground. He picked them up. He participated in what God was doing. He went there and he picked them up. And he put it in his sling, in his sleep. The whole, he participated what God was doing. 
We need to participate what God is doing in our lives, in this battle that we fight, the giants in our life, the circumstances in our life. We can't just lay over and say, well, God's going to fight my battles, and that's it. We have to participate. We have to be part of what God is doing. So, in verse 45, it talks about, well, let's read that. It says, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come with thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of army Israel, whom thou hast uh, defied. Here we find that this faith, he came in faith. God has provided the faith. He could have just ran and did what everybody else did. But God has provided that faith. We told you how that, that Saul had lost his courage. He had lost his courage. And here God has provided the courage. He provided faith for David to move forward. So God provided faith. He provided the stones. By the way, the Bible tells us that there's nothing too hard for God. Nothing too hard for God. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter your troubles and that, that's going on in life, no matter where America seems to be headed, nothing is hard for God. And so we move on and we see point three that God provided victory at the cross through faith in Jesus Christ. We said at the beginning here that this represents the world and the world darkness. And the fight and battle is against the darkness of this world. So God had provided victory at the cross at Jesus Christ. The victory is in Jesus. There was victory over sin. There's victory over the wrath to come to all those who don't believe. There is victory over the grave. There's victory in Jesus. So why did he come? Why did Jesus come? The Bible says in Mark, when Jesus heard it, he said unto them that they are the whole that have, not, that have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He came to die for you and me. He came to give his life for us. He came to conquer the darkness. He came to conquer the giants in our days and in the days to come. He came to move us to that marvelous light. He came to give us life. He came to give us eternal life. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know, according to Romans 6.23, that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He came to be victorious. He came so that we can be have victory in him. These giants in our life can be overcome because he's an overcomer. We are now overcomers, those who are in Christ. The Bible says in Acts, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at but, not command, but now command all men everywhere to repent. If you're here today, if you never surrendered your life, God is calling you here to repent. Come into repentance toward God. Surrender your life to him. John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. 
Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. There is no system. There is no basking the robins of 32 flavors up on the board. There's only one way. There's only one way. That is through Jesus Christ. You don't have multiple ways. One way. The Bible tells us that I have heard thee in the time of acceptance. And in the day of salvation, I have scorned thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You don't know if you leave this building today whether your life is going to end or not. If you have never accepted and received Christ as your Savior, and I'm not talking about having head knowledge. I'm not talking about I know God because I read the Bible. I'm talking about having a loving relationship with him. I'm talking about loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul. I'm talking about having the Holy Spirit of God come inside of you, living in with you. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the one and only <clears throat> way, the truth, and the light. The Bible says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you call upon him today? He knows your heart. He knows your need. He knows that he loves you dearly and that he wants you to come. Come to him. Jesus Christ had made a way. He came and that darkness is now gone. It's gone in my life because I'm a new creature in Christ. And that old things are passed away. That old man is going and dead. He's dead now. He want to rise up every now and then, you know. But praise God. Praise God for the people of God that we assemble together to help me keep on the right way. And we need to help each other to stay on the right way. the Goliaths in our lives. God is greater than our circumstances. God will provide. And victory is in Jesus Christ and him only. Praise God for this day. Give thanks always. For he lives and he lives with me. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, for what you have done for us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for that great salvation, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, as we go home today, that, Lord, that you will press upon our hearts, Lord God, that we need, Lord God, to speak from the mountaintops, speak from the rooftops, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.